If you're into cybersecurity or you're planning to join this career path, then one of the most important skills you need to learn is how to read logs. No, I mean seriously, how to actually read logs so you can fully understand what it's telling you. So if you feel like that's a skill that you're missing, then this video is for you. We're gonna run through some examples of how you can read the logs effectively so you're better prepared for this type of work. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Jono and I work in cybersecurity as a SOC analyst. And we'll start today's video by understanding the basics of logs. What are logs? You can think of logs as receipts. When you go into a grocery shop, you buy a couple of things like milk, eggs, chicken. And when you check out, the receipt provides you a bunch of details like the store location, the time of purchase, what you purchase, and the type of payment you used. Now, all of this information is tied to this specific event, which is your shopping. Logs on your computer work the same way. They're essentially a way of keeping track of all the events that are happening. And we have different type of logs too. We have error logs, audit logs, debug logs, and many more. Some of these types of logs are specific to an application. So for example, if I want to monitor user actions on an application, I would want audit logs. Now we need to talk about the different types of formats. This also depends on what systems or application we're talking about. One of the most common type of log is CSV or comma separated value. These are usually represented by the field names in the first row, followed by their values in the subsequent rows. This type of format is usually used for exporting large data sets. The next common type is JSON. These are enclosed in curly brackets, and within these brackets, we have field value pair wrapped in quotation with a colon. These type of logs are more often used for application logs, like for development stuff, based on my experience. The next common type of logs are syslogs, which is short for system logs, and they're usually used for internal consumption for investigations. For example, Windows security logs are a type of system event that tracks stuff like log logins, system modifications, and file accesses. These type of logs are very common in our day-to-day -day tasks as a SOC analyst as we're constantly monitoring for suspicious activity on end-user devices. And the last type of log format, which is also my least favorite, are the firewall logs. These type of logs don't have any field values to them, and they're separated by a space character. Usually, we will need to refer to documentation to understand what the values are, and that can be a hassle as it's not straightforward. All right, that covers most of the basics of what logs are. Now, let's get down to understanding how we can interpret these logs. The number one thing we need to understand is when we're tackling this kind of work, we need to understand what our goal is. How we approach the logs heavily depends on our task. A lot of times, a log event is going to have too much information more than you ever need. For example, if you have Windows logs on resource usage like CPU, GPU, RAM, and stuff, then a good use case for this would be for resource management so we can be alerted if the computer's RAM needs to be upgraded. So that was just one example. Let's take a look at some example of firewall logs because these are very common in everyday life as a stock analyst. Here we can see some individual values separated by spaces. We'll need to look at the documentation like this to understand what those values represent. Once we have that understanding, we can formulate a plan on how we can utilize this. So here we can see the basic firewall traffic like the source and destination IP addresses. The first thing we can do is to map the source IP addresses to their source location. Now that we have these data, we can start to think of use cases. I would ask myself questions like where are the IP addresses coming from? Are these firewall traffic expected? Are they legitimate? These questions will help us get creative on what we can do. So for example, if we're not expecting any traffic to come from North Korea, then a smart move would be to place a geographical block on that location. But what if we're expecting traffic from the US? Then how do we know which of the traffic within the US are legit? Usually the best practice would be to place a whitelist on our internal IP addresses or subnets. But in the real world, it's really hard to lock down your firewall to IP addresses and subnets. This is where the use case of threat intelligence feed comes in. We could run these IP addresses against a threat intel feed, which allows us to verify if the IP addresses are malicious. Most common threat intel feeds that I use are virus total and abuse IPDB, which are both free to use. This type of work now falls under threat hunting as you can schedule alerts and automations based on the results of these threat intel feeds. Now you've just experienced what it's like to be a SOC analyst. All we had were the source IP and the destination IP addresses, and we were able to come up with actionable security controls just from simple questions. Now let's look at another example, which is this Windows security event. Now looking at this again, you can ask yourself, what can I do to make this data useful? How can I interpret this so it improves our security controls? So in this example, this event is indicating that special privileges has been applied to this user. And then we have a list of privileges that was applied. Down at the bottom, we can see the time of event and also the computer which this happened on. The reason I mentioned these particular fields are not random. 
These fields are important in determining whether this event is expected. If you're not aware, one of the main goals of a hacker is to gain administrator access to a machine. Because once you're an admin, you pretty much have the power to do whatever you want. So in this example, the questions I would ask myself are whether this event is expected, do we expect any admin users to be created on this computer in the first place, what are the standard roles assigned to a new admin user, and was this admin user approved to be created? Now that we have those questions in place, we can start to brainstorm ideas on how we can action these questions. When we're dealing with machines, we need to make sure if it's an end user machine or a server. This is important because an end user would almost never create a local admin user on their machine, whereas a server might have workflows and automations which require a local admin to do its thing. So with this knowledge in mind, we can create an alert to monitor all end user machines to trigger if a local admin user gets created. For servers, we need more information. Usually in an IT department, we would have a team that manages the infrastructure of our systems. And this team would usually also handle the servers. We'll need to consult with them on any standard process when a local admin user gets created on a server. For example, an admin user on a server might only need elevated privileges to run a specific app. But if an admin user gets created and they were assigned more privileges than expected, then this is a clear indication that something else might be happening, potentially something malicious. So we can create an alert based on the admin role and permission set and trigger them when it falls outside of this permission set. Additionally, we could also track who's creating the user. If an account takeover happens, chances are the attacker will be on a remote IP address. So this leads back to the previous example of firewall traffic where we would have blocked this IP address if it's not from an expected location or if they were found in a database. As you can see, these systems are not isolated from one to another. A lot of times you'll find yourself working with logs from multiple systems when creating alerts for detection. Now you might be thinking it's a hassle to read all these logs manually like what I've just shown you, which is why a SIEM exists. A SIEM stands for Security, Information and Event Management, which is essentially a platform that allows you to collect log events from multiple sources. SIEMs are also smart enough to help you put the logs in their respective fields so you don't have to do the manual step that I did. If you want to learn more about the basics of SIEM, like Splunk for example, then make sure to check out this video up here as I go through the fundamentals that you need. Okay, so now that you understand how a stock analyst can come up with use cases on logs based on simple questions, which most beginners are lacking, you might be asking yourself, how do you even come up with these questions in the first place anyway? An easy way that I personally do would be to put myself in the shoes of someone that doesn't really have a lot of technical knowledge, like someone in the management team, for example. Because when you think about it, the questions that the management usually ask are high level questions. For example, if we're looking at email security, they don't want to know who specifically is sending spam emails to which of our specific internal user. All they want to know is how many in total are being spammed or how many malicious emails we're receiving and blocking. They care about the high level total numbers and as you progress, you can work your way down to the specifics and potentially create actionable alerts like blocking email senders and domains. I hope that makes sense to you guys. If not, then drop a comment down below and I'll try to explain it better there. That's it from me. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.